grew out of uh, meeting him last uh, November at the Farm and Food uh, Symposium sponsored by the Spokane Conservation District. But I felt like I knew Ray Archuleta. If you go to YouTube and Google his name, he, he lights up the place because he's appeared so many places and, and given such incredible presentations that Ray is warmly loved and respected virtually around the world. Uh, he has some Northwest roots. He spent some time in Malheur County, Oregon uh, with the National Resources Conservation Service where he had a 34 year career as an eminent soil scientist. Many of you know that uh, Pastor Roger, uh, who was our preceding pastor here, talked often about Gabe Brown's operation in Bismarck, near Bismarck, North Dakota. And uh, Ray is a business partner with Gabe Brown, I learned, and, and they go way back in terms of regenerative agriculture. Ray, I could talk all day about accolades for you. I don't need to do that. You present yourself as a warm-hearted Christian gentleman, and that's how I want to welcome you to speak to all who are listening today. Thank you. David, thank you for being so gracious. That was very kind. Um, I will pay you later, but uh, we won't tell anybody about it, okay, David? But you, you are so kind. You know, folks, the reason I want to do this because, uh, one, uh, the gospel is so precious. And I think that what we're doing now with regenerative agriculture, if it wasn't for Christ and the gospel, we couldn't have the healing of the earth. So I, I'm. that's why to me, uh, talking to a precious group like you, because we're all uh, connected to each other, not only in the quantum realm, but the spiritual realm. So thank you for what uh, all of you do and how you care about the planet. So David, uh, I'll just tell real quick about myself, just a really quick, because I got too much to cover. First, I, I, I grew up in New Mexico and I um, started my career, like David said, and that's not all important, but one of the things I wanted to say that uh, uh, I did spend 30, 34 years, like, you, and, uh, like David said, and the, the, the whole thing that really got me to this place, even to today, is that I got to see a lot of agriculture throughout the country. And I'm here because, I'll be honest with you, is because uh, I saw immense uh, hopelessness. It was about halfway through my career, I realized that something was incredibly wrong that the land was becoming more and more degraded. And I could see that generations of, far, uh, of young people could not come back onto the farm because there was no money in it. And so, and I noticed that our water was becoming more and more polluted. And so I had no hope, but today I'm going to show you hope. Uh, and I'm honest, I got around 40 years old during halfway of my career, I was very, very depressed because I did not see how we were gonna heal the planet. But what I'm gonna share with you today, it is amazing. And I am so grateful to share this hopeful message. Well, let's get started. And I'm gonna uh, provide a little um, PowerPoint um, for you folks and to give you, show you some of the imagery that I wanna show you. And um, let me see, uh, let's do this one. Yeah, but there we go. And let me see if we, everybody, can everybody see that slide? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, you only see one slide, right? You, you see one slide, correct? I see slides and notes. Okay, that's not the one I want to do. Okay, that's not that's not the one. Well, let me do the screen. Let me let me just move it over here, and let me do this. Stop share because I I selected the wrong one. I apologize, folks. Um, you've got to get the right screen or you'll see just exactly what you just said. You'll see all my the notes and all the slides. And that's not what I wanted you to see. How about, how about now? 
Yes. One slide, right? Okay. Yep, one slide. Okay. Beautiful. Uh, my title of my slide, Regenerative Agriculture, the New Covenant Age of Healing the Earth. And that's why I love the word covenant. And I noticed that you have that same word in your, in your church. Most people, and just quickly, I just really, my favorite way of explaining a marriage, most people here say, well, marriage is a 100 to 100 uh, uh, percent on the partner. My partner does 100 percent and mine other, and I do 100 percent. But the really, the true thing is, and I just noticed that I spelled covenant wrong, but ignore that. But real, a covenant is really this. I will do my part of the marriage, whether you do your part or not. Ray, I was so yeah. sure. I was. Go ahead. That's all right. No, that's all right. Is it, is it the speaker? Is it mine? No, no, no. Okay, so let's continue. So again, God has done his part of the covenant, whether we do our part or not. And I'm going to show you what is happening throughout the globe. The things I'm going to tell you here, the call to action is understanding that everything is one. One of the things I understand when I teach all over the country with farmers, they do not understand connectness and relationship how everything is connected. Every living creature is connected to the collective one. Quantum physics is teaching that all is one. Ecology teaches all is one. The other thing is that the soil is alive. It, it just blows me away. And including me in my eight years of college training, and even though I went to graduate school for soil, soils, I didn't really grasp that the soil was absolutely alive. It's just as alive as all of us in, in that church and all of us throughout the planet. In fact, we know now that humans are 90% bacteria and 10% is you. So in other words, if somebody calls you a dirt bag, don't take it personally. Scientifically, that is correct. We are dirt on legs. And the third thing is, I'm going to talk to you about the mandate of the real mandate God gave to us about dominion. It, dominion really means to nurture and love the creation, but most just as important to mimic the design, the principles, the patterns. I call it biomimicry, mimic life. And then the last one I want to talk about is having the right mindset and what posture should Christians have for healing the earth and helping healing the earth. The biggest obstacle I will tell you right now, and as I travel and watch our planet become more and more degraded, is human nature and our social conditioning. You know, the Apostle Paul, if you read Paul's writings, you read the scriptures, Paul talks, uh, tells us very many times in the scripture that we're the problem. It's our human nature. It's our evil human nature it's greedy it's it is what it is but we also have the good part of us but here's the thing that i started noticing through uh, as i travel that we all have gone through social conditioning we get conditioned through our family through our local neighborhoods uh in church in our work in our universities we become conditioned in case example of uh, conditioning they did a study where they put monkeys in this room and they hanged some uh, uh, some bananas. And as the monkeys tried to get the bananas, they got the fire hose and wet them. And they did that several times that none of the monkeys would touch the banana. But the moment they put in a new monkey, the new monkey goes in, heads for the bananas, and then the rest of the group punishes that monkey and starts to beat it up we start to notice that's the same thing that goes in farm communities. When you start going to regenerative agriculture or you go to organic, or you start farming differently, the whole community goes against you. Same thing at work when something new happens or, or a scientist brings out a new piece of information, the whole group comes in and beats you to death about it because it goes against their view of the world. Good example of how that plays out. As you can see right here, this is a picture that I took aerially as we as I fly throughout the country. Notice there's no green except for a couple of spots. This is happening all over Minnesota, 
New York, Texas, California. You can see the scarring of the planet in our urban and our agriculture. And yet many will say, are very in the conservatives or any group will say, but men do not impact the climate. But I'm here to tell you, look at the land. Does it impact the way we disturb the surface of the planet? Of course it does. In fact, we know it is trees and plants that helps bring in the rain, that stabilizes the climate. In fact, if we took all the trees and vegetation off the planet, this planet would be rock and ice. We need to understand, cannot have climate without soil and plants. We have an incredible disconnectness and myself included. This is the way the land looks right now as you travel. In fact, our agency was discovered, was made in uh, 1935. You can see this right here. Uh, and you can see Colorado in 2014. Look at this huge dust uh, plume of soil flowing. That's, this is why they started NRCS or Soil Conservation Service. Please understand that this was under an organic system. There was no chemicals. Huge amounts of tillage created this and poor rotations and poor management created the dust bowl and it changed the climate because there was no veg very few vegetation and we tilled the ground. That was organic, that was not regenerative system. Notice this happened, this happened in December this year. Why is this happening? Don't we have the best universities in the world? Aren't we supposed to have the best schools? We have spent billions of dollars and we're still here. What's going on? What's the problem? And it, being in an agency that this was my job to fix that problem. Why is that still happening? And the land is becoming more and more desertified. 38% of our land is uncovered. Please understand that California, New Mexico, Arizona, Washington, Idaho, most of those lands were prairies. They were grasslands. They look like this now. Then what happens with all that sensible heat coming off the surface and all that bare ground, you've heard about all the massive flooding that was happening in California. And that was, people were calling it the rivers, they call it, uh, they call it river, uh, vapor storms, giant vapor storms and what's happening. Well, what's happening is when there's a huge amount of heat coming from the soil surface and what it does, it not only pushes the rain clouds away, but it creates huge amounts of vapor. Many of us have been focused on CO2, CO2, but that's only part of it. The largest amount of gas, one of the largest vapors in the atmosphere is water vapor. Our water vapor is displaced. We have too much CO2 and too much water vapor in the atmosphere. And that's because we have too much bare ground and not enough plants. We always look at things too singularly. It's usually always multidimensional, our problems. So if you can see in this little video, see most people don't realize that 40% of our rain comes from inland. You can see in this little miniature video is plants evapotranspire. But if, if, that, if there are no plants and no vegetation, you get more sensible and rating heat coming out. And that pushes clouds away and disrupts the small water cycle. So what you're seeing globally is it's the disruption of the small water cycle, which affects the large water cycle. And then this happens, massive flooding. Then it comes down at eight or 10, 12 inches a rain at one time. And the, the rain, the, the, the water cycle is becoming more and more disrupted. And we're not having steady flows of climate, but disruptions. And then people say, well, they blamed the forest fires uh, on poor, poor forest management. But in reality, once you understand that everything's connected, it does matter how we farm in Iowa. 
it does far matter how we farm in the rest of the country. Because if you have bare ground most of the year and you disrupt that water cycle, which is connected to all the major climate and the large water cycle, now we have areas that are drier. And then when we do get the rain, it comes very quickly and we get drier. So the forest fires that we have, it's not just poor management, it's really the destruction of the water cycle because the way we have too much bare ground and in the way we farm, it's not just the forest is dry. The forests are becoming dry because we our cycles are disrupted. And then another thing is happening is we have a lot of farmers committing suicide. And I said, how in the world farming and ranching, and I'm a rancher myself, I got 155 acre ranch, and I love farming and ranching because I wanted to be on the land. There's nothing more glorious in being part of God's creation. And I said to myself, well, how can that be in such an awesome responsibility? Why are farmers committing suicide? It's the huge amount of debt that they have. Most people don't understand farmers are the poorest millionaires. They own a lot of infrastructure, but have very few, very low cash flow because they have spent huge amount of money on equipment and chemicals and pesticides. They don't under, most people do not understand the stress that farmers are under. And this is also happening in our rural communities from the West to the Midwest to the South. We're having a dying of rural America. What, why? See, the blessing of the land, the money cash flow used to flow from the rancher to the farmer to the local community, supplied the general store, the gas station. Now the money is going to the government. It is going to corporate America, to the fertilizer makers, to the tractor makers, to the tillage equipment makers. The money is flowing not to the community, but to corporate America. And what do I mean by the money going to the government? Well, government cost share programs like CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, was intended to put more grassland on very marginal ground. But most people don't understand that most of the land, 50% of the land is not owned by the farmers, but it's owned by people outside the community. So the money that's supposed to go for the monthly CRP payments that's done by the government actually goes to some other person outside the community. So the cash flow, the, the flow and the blessings of the land is not flowing through the farmer and rancher, but it's flowing out. And this is the results, more drug use, depressions, communities falling apart the dying of rural America. So it all comes back to this. Really, if you really think about it, our soils are naked. They're naked because of the shame. In, in biblical times, being naked was a shameful thing. The, in our shame for our lack of understanding, our disconnectness, our ignorance, our soil is naked because it's not protected, the, the soil, and it's hungry because no longer has plants. Most people don't understand the soil does not eat without plants. It does not feed the microbes without living plants. It's thirsty because all the water is evaporating off the surface and it's running a fever because the temperatures are so hot. And when temperatures get too hot, it destroys and kills microbes. So the reality, we have bare ground on 38% of our soil surface, we have latent heat pushing clouds away. We're getting too much water vapor in the atmosphere and it's leading to chaotic results climatically. Some context, please understand before humans started farming the North, uh, North America, our soils look like this. Now they look like this because of our farming. This used to be the same soil. I only have two words to say that. Paradise lost. We have dysfunctional soils throughout the globe. Our soils used to be rich in organic matter. They used to be diverse life in them. 
the soils are the most diverse ecosystems on the planet and they're becoming degraded. So why did this happen? The reason it happened, ladies and gentlemen, is because of this. We don't understand the power of life. I tell farmers, that is compaction. How does that tree survive that compaction? It's because that tree makes association with fungi and bacteria and can break rock down. They get nutrients from that rock and moisture from fungi and bacteria. We don't understand the power of life. I tell farmers, this is what you're dealing with. Look how elegant the soil is. This is the life. I said, how many of you would run over your pet with a disc? And some farmers would say, well, it depends on the pet. You know, you're always finding one of those type of farmers to be funny, but the reality is this is what we're dealing, a living organism. So what's happening to our soils? See, when I went to college, I was taught we have to do tillage. We have to hay and we have to use pesticides and we have to use fertilizers. This is the way I was taught to farm. We have to control nature. We have to force it because it's all about yield. Not one person, not one relative, not one mentor, not one professor told me, no, Ray, your goal is to mimic and nurture and love nature. Mimic it. Your farm and ranch should look like the natural system. I was not taught that. We were not taught how all this elegance connected organisms. This is the nutrient cycle. This is our living soil. This is the connectedness that we're talking about. But massive tillage, overspraying, too much insecticides, too much fungicides, damage the connectedness, the function of these organisms. We were not taught that. This is a good example of a living soil. When you get your microscope and you look in your soil, this is what we should see. Nematodes, protozoa, feeding on bacteria, Notice this is a living soil because it has no till, no tillage in the soil, cover crops. Let me, and you'll see it again, but notice this one where there's no till, but high chemical, lots of fungicides, lot of insecticides. Notice no life, no nematodes, just a little bit of bacteria. But to show you again, cover crops, cow integration, and no tillage, life in the soil. We are mimicking nature. See, nature doesn't till. She always keeps the ground covered and she has animals integration. Notice the difference. So now I teach farmers to do this. We are mimicking the prairie and the forest. What, what's common with both? They're covered 24 seven. They're capturing sun. They both have animals. They both have living roots. They're both diverse. We are mimicking this globally now. It is spreading. How sad. The Bible told us thousands and thousands of years, ask the beast and they will teach you the birds of heaven. Biomimicry has been around for thousands and thousands of years. It would have been nice. I would have understood that scripture before I started graduate school. It would have been quite helpful. And then this is the architecture that we're trying to mimic. We want our cover crops to look like this, different plant shapes, different leaf shapes. We want living roots to feed the array of life from the bottom. Our cover crops look like this, mimicking the prairie, the architecture of the prairie. Notice here the farmer on the left that has no relationship, no understanding of the soil. This farmer now, this is the new way of farming. We are rolling the cover crop down, laying it down like a blanket and creating an instant skin like the forest. And they are planting corn, soybean, cotton, pumpkins into that living skin. And then the, they come out and cover the soil. It is a beautiful thing that we're doing now. Which farmer understands that the soil's alive?
This is an organic farmer, 7,000 acres, organic no-till. Notice how he's laying the cover crop down on thousands of acres. And he is planting cereal rye. He's I mean, planting corn and soybeans. the rye and he rolls it down it creates a blanket a living skin like the forest suppresses weeds keeps the soil cool feeds the microbes and it also increases yields we're doing this on pumpkins squash we're doing on gardens we're doing on thousands of acres that farmer rick clark saved saved 700 to eight hundred thousand dollars a year on chemicals, no more fertilizers, no more pesticides, no more fungicides, no more insecticides. Beautiful. Where I went to college in New Mexico State, this is the way we were taught to grow pecans. They told us, you got to leave the ground bare. You got to leave it naked. That's what we we're taught because of competition. Now we are doing it this way. We are planting living covers. Because we do it now, we don't have to use fungicides no more. No more insecticides. We keep the soil cool. And it stabilizes the the um, the climate uh, the climate under the the trees. Less irrigation. We were socially and academically conditioned to think that nature is competitive. Yes, competition happens, but she is more collaborative than she is competitive. Remember, that was the science of the time. I'm always cautious about science. I always question science if it's done in the right premise. Does it glorify the creation? And does it glorify the human body? If it does not, I say, go back to your lab. You got it wrong. Now we are grazing sheep under these orchards and the farmers making more income. Notice here, the way I was taught in college, that was the science, get big, Make it industrialize. The pigs in the left, the factory farms, $190 that the farmer makes on that. The farm on the right, $600 a hog. Letting the natural uh, pig <laughs> meet its design, its intended design. This is the intention, the way we were supposed to farm. Does the farming allow the natural system to meet its design? And, and does it treat the animals with love and respect? Which one does that? Does that? No. This is why young people, 70% of young people read labels. They do not want their food raised here. They don't want GMOs. They want their animals to, to be come from here. Grass-fed beef, not corn-fed, grass-fed. Now, Wrapping up, uh, wrapping up, and I'll show you the hope that I have. That is so exciting. Not only are we doing that in cropland, but let me show you how we are restoring the range. I was born in 1961. New Mexico State has the largest research center, uh, rangeland uh, center station in North America. This is the way it looked in 1961. This is the way I look. it looks when I went to college. This is the way it looks now. I grew up two and a half hours south of here. This used to be the largest Indian ruins in North America. They're still there, but this used to be a rainfall. This used to be a forest, a yellow pine forest. The Anasazi took too much, deforested it, became to change the local climate, and then it collapsed. It's not just Europeans, it's humans. Our human nature does this. Now, let me show you how quick, how amazing uh, what is happening in Chihuahua. I call this the butterfly effect. It only takes one person that builds community and affects another person, and we can make a tornado of change. This is Gay Brown. Like David was talking, he's, a, he's my friend, my ex-business partner, because I sold my part of the company. And this is Juan Pablo, and this is Alejandro. Jesus impacted Alejandro. All of us have something in common. We got to listen to Alan Sabri. 
Alan Savory had a huge impact on us. He taught us to look at things as whole, to mimic nature. Let me show you the impact of that. I grew up here, up in the northern part, went to college here. This ranch is four hours south in the Chihuahuan Desert. This is a 600 cow calf operation. You only get six to 11 inches of rain. The summers are so hot, you can throw an egg on the sidewalk and you can fry it. It is intensely hot in the summers. And I would say to myself, how in the world? And I would honestly say this, God, praying as I would drive from Missouri to New Mexico, I said, God, how are we going to heal Texas, Oklahoma? How are we going to heal the West? I did not know how we were going to heal that whole landscape. But first, let me show you the context. So to give you perspective, the Spaniards have diaries showing that New Mexico was grassland. This is a picture from Alejandro. Look at the Apaches. This is grass. It was a prairie. Saudi Arabia recently, archaeologists found elephant tusk under Saudi Arabia. I believe that most deserts are land and man caused. Look at this right here. If you drive, if you drive through Nevada, if you drive through California, if you go to Wyoming, if you go most of the West, it looks like this. Most of New Mexico looks like this. So how are we going to heal it? Mimicking life, biomimicry, God's principles in the scriptures that he tells us how to mimic nature. This is how Alejandro does, does it? He's got a he's got a 20, 30, 25 to 30,000 acre ranch. He fenced it with hot wire and he put all these drinking troughs. He now allows, he moves the cattle like buffalo and he moves it from fence, from paddock to paddock to paddock to give it rest and recovery and gives a whole year. They build their own tanks. They get no government help. They use a one strand hot wire every 150 feet. So every 200 acres, they put a paddock they move cattle from one side of the ranch, from one paddock to a more degraded paddock. And they do it, do it during the rainy season. And they move the cows like buffalo, all in one group. I will show you that in a second. The cattle are resource linkers. What they do is they carry seed on their height. They carry it in the manure. They carry it in the hoof. So imagine during the rainy season, you take the cows from one part of the ranch to one paddock to the other paddock, you let them disturb the soil, you let them urinate, they defecate, they bring seed, and let's see what they do. And how do they move them? They use the Taramara cowboys. They move cows 800 times a year, twice a day. They use cowboys, only two. And let's see, come on, to the next one. Let's see how they do it. So here's how they move the animals. This was taken in October with a um, drone. Two cowboys move like bison, like the antelope, like the Serengeti moving huge herds, trampling, urinating, defecating, stimulating the microbes. This is what we missed. It was always about the microbes. It's always been about biomimicry. And then what's the result? Alejandro started in 2006, but he really didn't start until just the last four years intensely. And look at the, look, now keep a look at that mountain. A little ridge there. Notice the progression coming in. That was taken in October of last year. Look how the land is healing. The drone footage of me and Alejandro, we are getting islands of green to starting to spread in the ocean of desert. Ladies and gentlemen, I have hope now. We can fix and heal the land. 
a lot quicker and sooner if we just mimic God's creation. Again, I have hope. Right here is a picture taken by Alejandro. This is Alejandro's side of the ranch. It is raining on his side of the ranch and it's not raining on the neighbors. This is a picture showing an alarm that goes off on his, at his ranch where he gets more rain. Isn't that beautiful on how we get, it is plants that bring the rain. Masanubu said, Fukuoka, if you ever get any of his books, they are amazing. That man taught me more ecology than any other man. He said it was in American desert that I suddenly realized that rain does not fall from the heavens. It comes from the ground. Desert formation is not due to the absence of rain, but the rain ceases to fall because the vegetation has disappeared. We have too much bare ground, ladies and gentlemen, throughout the globe. See, people don't understand what regenerative agriculture, regenerative agriculture, I use that term from the Bible. Regenerative agriculture comes from a renewed heart and mind. It's a heart to mind where God transforms you. What did Paul say? You need to go through a transformation in your heart and mind to grasp the gospel. It is a journey of life. It's a different way of thinking that loves and emulates nature's intelligent design. It's a way of loving all of God's creation, every human, every organism. It brings peace to every creature. Regenerative agriculture is that. It's learning how to use the tools effectively. We teach six, we teach six principles of soil health. All of them you can read for yourself. Reduce the physical chemical disturbance, cover the soil, leave a living root. All these that nature does, integrate animals, cover crops, cover crops. But here's the one that I came up with in 2014. We all need to understand our social, our spiritual, our ecological context. Context, context, context. It is so critical. So when I talk to a person, I walk into their farm and to their ranch. I need to understand their social context their cultural context, their ecological context, their economic context. Context is everything, ladies and gentlemen. Wrapping it up at the last three or four slides. Recently, I come across a book that just absolutely ripped into my soul, stripped the hard pen in my soul. You know, there's several books. I think all of us can come up with certain people that have changed your life. We've all have butterfly events. I call them butterfly events where you can have a tornado of change. And this book was one of them, of course, the scriptures and other authors. But recently, Emmanuel uh, Contungale and a, a Christian brother shared this book with me. It's called Mirror to the Church. I personally think that every church should make this a required reading now. Why? Because I think the church, myself, I lost my identity. I did not realize that I was becoming very, very tribal in the way I looked at things. The tribe of the Republican Party, the tribe of the Democratic Party, the tribe of the masked, the tribe of the unmasked. We, I was becoming very tribal, the tribe of being an American. The tribe of being Rwandan or Ugandan. What Emmanuel showed me in his book of the genocide, what happened in Rwanda was very, very sobering. He was showing, and the reason he calls this mirror to the church, because he was talking about how it was, uh, here is a country that was 85% Christian and the majority of the killing was happening among Christians. Can you imagine today that you guys were going to church and you did and you sang the Psalms and the next minute you get into your work clothes and you stack, you start whacking on each other and dismembering each other with machetes. Why did that happen? Why did the church have no power to say no? 
and how 800,000 people died and people that profess Christ, what happened? It is because we as a people lost our identity. What he is saying, it's not about being more American or being more Republican or more Democratic. It's always being this, being more Christ-like. My identity is with Christ. And when you make your identity with Christ, you're going to find out that both parties are wrong and that a majority of people are wrong. Priests were involved in the killing of many, many people that happened in Rwanda. And Emmanuel was saying and saying to the world, this is a reflection to us as a people. Who, who, what is your true identity? This book was very sobering to me. Do I have the power to say no to the destruction of our planet? Do we have the power to say no to unrighteousness and to the poverty that is going on? Are we standing up as a people? I have read this book six times, ladies and gentlemen, and I am reading it again because I have to be reminded what is my true identity. He is telling us as a people, how are we engaging in the world? He has shown many times throughout the generations of the churches, the churches um, did a pious posture. In the past, we have done a political posture and we're still doing some of those postures and a pastoral posture. What does he mean by pious posture? A pious posture is we go do good things, but we question, but we do not question like the road to Damascus, uh, not the road to Damascus. You remember the man that, the Good Samaritan, we may go help that poor person that was laying there, but we never ask because of the pious posture, what caused that problem? Why was the condition so bad that that per poor person was almost beaten to death? What he's saying is the church in the past had the pious posture, a political posture, a political posture got involved in the politics, but did not understand that one has to be careful what political party the church puts themselves to, because then if you abide by the rules of Rome, you also get impacted by that. Case in point, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. When Dietrich Bonhoeffer went against Hitler, only 90%, 90% of the church at that time did a political posture. They went with Hitler. Only 10% said no. And then the pastoral posture is when there's war and all these things, bad things happen, here comes the church. They do a pastoral posture. They come in just to help with the healing. But that is never strong enough to say no to the problem. And then the one that really makes a difference, and, say, and Emmanuel argues, the only way that we are ever going to stop some of these events to happen is to have a prophetic posture. It's a faithful action that says no, that understands the reality of God's kingdom, that the kingdom is in you, that we are willing to take the trials, to willing to stand up. In fact, many times in the mirror to the church, there was one incident where one person stood up to the military. Many people stood up to the military. One lady was a sister to a colonel, and they would not bother her. But it came to a point when the army came to her place, and they told her, if you do, if you do not stop hiding the Tutsis, we're going to kill you. And she says, I refuse. If you kill them, you're going to have to kill me. She said no, and she stood up, and she died. That is the prophetic posture.
willing to stand up, to willing to realize that the kingdom is here now, that we are a reflection of God. Many times we forget Christianity. Christ says, if they hate me, they will hate you because you bring the news and you are the light and supposed to be, we're supposed to be an example. Another thing that I think is a problem, and I personally, and this is my own personal opinion, another thing that I think that hurts the church, the church is living out of context. I personally believe the doctrine of end times has really, really hurt the church. Many have taken the book of Revelation and they think it means for now. I personally believe the book of Revelation was written for 70 AD. It was the prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem that already happened. Many have read the Matthew 24 and here's what uh, Christ told the disciples. He told the disciples, you see, and he showed them the buildings of the temple. You see this temple. Do you see all these things? I said to you, not one of these stones will not stand. All of them will be one tossed upon the other. He was a talking about that temple. Some of the disciples got to see the destruction of Jerusalem. Over 1 million Jews died. Jerusalem was burned to the ground. People don't understand that that temple represented as many times was called the earth. Most people don't realize that the first temple was the Garden of Eden and that the temple at that time had imagery of the Garden of Eden. It was not uncommon to call the earthly temple, the physical temple, the earth. We now are the new temple. And what that flawed doctrine has done has caused Christians to do this in our communities and stop the healing, help healing the planet. We have put our heads in the sand and has said, guess what? God's gonna come back and he's gonna fix the earth. He's gonna come and heal it. That is to me very flawed. And because I feel we have a wrong doctrinal view of the end times and has made us Christians that put our heads in the sand. Here are several websites that I think that are very helpful to teach. There are many of us that are realizing that I had it wrong. I had eight years of college wrong. I was willing to question my paradigms. Here's a great one, Mike Rogers preaching the kingdom of God. And another one, the Proph Prophecy of Reformation Institute by Dr. John Noe. So what can we do as Christians? First thing I say, folks, we need to not forget our identity. We need to understand our context. We have to say no to the current system. We have to say no to what is going on, to the degradation of our planet, to the degradation of our communities. We know we have to know God's word well. We have to realize the kingdom is now. It's in us. We are the new temple. We are supposed to reflect his glory. It is sad to me that it is Christians who have the least involvement in healing the planet. We have more people helping in the Democratic Party or other parties that do not even profess Christ, and they donate money, and they get involved. But let's be honest. A lot of people that who profess Christ tend to be more conservative, tend to be more in the Republic Party, and yet where are they? And some of the most degraded farms and ranches come from those who profess Christ or at least who go to church. That's disturbing to me. Number five, God's instruction to us is don't sit there. Don't stand there. Go. Let's get involved. Let's be involved in the healing of the planet. It's now. What can we do practically? Buy your food locally. Know your farm. Take a soil health class, academy. If you don't know about soils, go talk to others. Share the Kiss the Ground movie with everybody. Share, if you have not seen it, see it, share it. Build community. 
of healers. I tell farmers, don't do this by yourself. You will spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how the natural system works. Build community. And the last one, and I'll say it again, we must remember that the kingdom is in us. We are in the new age. I really believe that. I see the planet being healed and I have hope. Thank you, David. Thank you folks for sharing, for allowing me to, to speak today with you. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to uh, 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 communicate with you. And thank you, David. Thank you, Ray, for really giving us a lot of stimulating thoughts. And I'm happy to tell you that I've got three grandchildren here who watched Kiss the Ground last night with our family. Yeah. And, and even two younger ones, we kind of lost them with the French speaking gentleman, but otherwise they even enjoyed Kiss the Ground. And I encourage all of you to watch yeah. it. Now you mentioned to me that there's a sequel planned for this year. Yes. Is that still in the works? Yes, David, it's called Common Ground. Common Ground It's going to be coming out. And it's going to be more the stories of the farmers and ranchers. And Gabe and I are going to be in it still. We want it not to be in it because it's not really about us. It's about the, the healing of the land. And so, yes, it's, it's happening. Uh, Ray, one of our master gardeners, Jackie Seitz, is commenting, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and inspiring me. Thank you, Jackie, for thank joining you. us. Do any others, we have just a very few minutes left, do any, any others of you have a question for Ray? Well, that's great. Okay. Jackie, thank you. I'll just say, Jackie, thank you for planting a garden. Get your kids involved in the garden. Help have them touch the soil. It's really important. Yeah, does anybody that's joining us online on Zoom have a question? Mike can unmute you. Yeah, unmute, yourself. unmute yourself and then speak up. Ray, I'm surprised that we don't have questions. That's okay. I understand some people don't like to um, ask questions and some are in shock. <laughs> okay. My, maybe, Mike asked me to try one I'm more shocked. time. Uh, MJ, you want to come up and take the mic, please? Oh, would you put the six principles of soil health back up, Ray? Yes, abs I would love to. Yes, thank you for... I would. And you can just type Google six principles of soil health, but this is the ones. And what I did is give you a little flavor of a three-day school. Uh, reduce chemical and biological and physical stress, that's tillage, uh, over grazing, uh, fungicides, insecticides, cover the soil all the time with a, with a skin or a living root. Rotations, diversity, 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 and integrate animals into your soil as much as you can. And the last one is understand your social, cultural, ecological, economic context, context, context. They tell us never read the scriptures out of context. Always read everything in context. Context is everything. Is that helpful? That's helpful. Yep, and leave it up you just can... another minute. She's writing, and then Joyce yes. says, "Thank you for shining." We lost it, but okay, it's in the chat, Ray. But we do have those who and, joined online, and I can't say enough and, how and much get, we appreciate you. You're welcome, today. and then you can just Google. You can also just Google six health principles, and it'll come up. And go to our website called SoilHealthAcademy.org. I'm the co-founder and understanding ag that I'm a co-founder of those two companies. And one's a nonprofit. And so you'll find the six principles there. It is definitely well worth it. It's amazing to me. Uh, many farmers will spend millions of dollars on equipment 
but won't spend twelve or thirteen hundred dollars to go to a class to change their life. I, I, I'm just amazed. You know, farmers that come to our schools save hundreds of thousands of dollars for the rest of their lives. And how? We're just teaching them how God made the design. We're teaching them how to mimic the creation. That's what biomimicry is. Pretty simple. Well, this church uh, is pretty familiar with regenerative agriculture, Ray. Uh, of course, surrounding Spokane, as you saw last the fall when you were here, it's, it's a great uh, wheat growing area, uh, a, a great agricultural area. And, you know, you had quite an impact with that food and farm symposium. Uh, our local church here, we had a three week study about three years ago using Dr. David Montgomery's material from the University of Washington on regenerative agriculture. And so our community garden that, that I bragged to you about, we're pretty happy with the, I think it was 4,942 pounds that were donated to local food banks from Eden Community Gardens here. And that's, that just shows that our people are committed to healthy, organic growing of fruits and vegetables for all people. So good, if David, no one else you know, has a word, we will say goodbye to Ray, but thank him so much for taking time. Give him a hand. Will you? Thank you. Hey, David, I just want to say one more thing. David, we are going to be, Alejandra and I are going to be in Spokane in June. Really? Yeah, the week of June the 20th. The week of June the 20th. Talk to, we are, we are going to do some workshops and the district's going to have us come back. So we so will be in Spokane the 20th, the week okay. of the 20th. And that's sponsored by the Conservation District again. Yes, they, you will know about it. Okay, thank so, you so much. Thank you, Ray. I hope for we can see you live. Today. Thank you, folks. Mm -hmm. Have a good, have a good Sabbath. Okay, you too. Bye now.